This sounds like a pretty good outline. We should do this. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Disability Clinic, where people living with disabilities represent themselves. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephanie Van, a Vietnamese woman with long dark hair up in a bun, wearing a navy blouse and sitting in front of a colorful bookshelf. Joining us today is Matthew Alanis, an award-winning screenwriter who strives to tell stories that express a broader and more complex human narrative. Thank you for coming on the show, Matt. It's great to have you. My name is Matthew Alanis. I am a Mexican-American male. I have, let's see, medium black hair. I have a mustache and goatee. And right now I am wearing a purple polo shirt. And I'm sitting in front of a mirror with some fake frames to make it look like windows behind me. <laughs> Very stylish, looking good. <laughs> Thank you. I've been a writer for close to 10 years, I think. I've been writing screenplays, really studying um, the art of storytelling, st uh, studying filmmaking. I come from an architecture background. I have a degree in architecture and I did practice um, for several years, but storytelling was kind of always gnawing at me. Um, and so it's something that I've, I've always been passionate about and felt that I wanted to do. So I, I did go to film school. I think I graduated around 2013. So yeah, right after that, I started I started writing and it wasn't up until until recently, maybe the last five years. I've always tried to write about disability and from my perspective, but um, it wasn't until I attended uh, Superfest out in San Francisco, which is one of the largest and well-known disability film festivals. When I attended that, I just, I saw disability in, in film in a way that I've been craving. And they're one of the few festivals, in my opinion, that actually um, do have qualifiers for representing people with disabilities in film and the media. And shortly after that, I remember sent an email to the to the coordinator of the event. And then I think next year she asked me to be a juror for their film festival. And so I did that and I took on the responsibility of kind of learning more. And in doing so, I think I've, I've really tried to become an advocate, um, not only with my storytelling, but also just through my lived experience and through my, um, my little bit of knowledge I have about movies and TV and story in general. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That is awesome. Um, I'm so glad you're here today. Um, and I can't wait to dive into our discussion about disability representation through the decades of filmmaking and sort of character tropes that are classic and maybe problematic and then where we're headed in the future. Let's yeah, get into it. Definitely. I wanted to really kind of hone in on what I thought representation really means because that word is kind of thrown out a, a lot and we don't think we really investigate what, what that really means. And, and really for me, it comes down to, to two questions. It's like, what are we representing? What about disability are we representing? Right. And and who is doing the representing? I think those two things have kind of been synonymous with disability um, film since its inception, since we were introduced into the medium. And in, in thinking about those things um, and doing a little bit of research, I did see some kind of correlation between a few models of disability. And what I came up with was the five that kind of stick out to me are the moral, the charity, the medical, the social um, and then the rights. And then within the rights, we also have the new one of disability justice. In researching that, you know, I'm, I'm involved with Superfest a lot and I'm involved with the Paul K. Longmore Institute. And in his book, um, Why I Burned My Book and Other Essays on Disability, he deals with a lot of aspects of disability, obviously, but he has a chapter in there strictly devoted to movies, to film, and it's called Screening Stereotypes. And I found an interesting correlation of, he, he talks about characters of disability. So he has um, the criminal as a character of disability. And, and for me, that, that we can get deeper into this, but mm -hmm. I, I do feel like there's like, it, it falls into that kind of moral model. So how would you describe the the moral model of disability to someone who is new to this? that the person with disability is responsible for their disability. And typically what we see there is that it's um, a punishment for a sin. It's like, oh, your, your mother and father must have done something bad in order for you to be born with a disability. Or it is something that you did in your life that all of a sudden has made you disabled, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so therefore, in, in film at least, tends to be a villain and tends to want revenge on the able-bodied world around him. And, and we see that time and time again, you know, if the disabled villain, if his, if his foe is the heroic able-bodied person, that is a pure example of him taking revenge on the able-bodied world. And we can see that in one of the movies that, you know, that I remember, I, I, I like the, the, the content, the subject matter was cool because I grew up reading comic books, but it was M. Night Shyamalan's Unbreakable, right? And, and there's a, a perfect example of the person with disabilities being the villain, right? Because, you know, he was born with, um, brittle bone disease, right? I have something called osteogenesis imperfecta. If there is someone like me in the world, and I'm at one end of the spectrum, couldn't there be someone else, the opposite of me at the other end? 
and and here he is his foe right is this um able-bodied white hero right and so with super strength right super strength that is a kind of a a perfect example of the moral model where it's it's we're we're seeing it people disabilities as as just inherently evil because of their disability or as a result of their disability and then also we have like the monster the subhuman character and 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 of course the criminal is like dr no james bond dr strange love all these kind of like bad guy yeah my work has given me a unique knowledge of radioactivity but not without costs as you see i have a plan <laughs> Monsieur has been walked. I'm thinking of um, like Dune 2 is going to come out soon and the character who's the villain in that classically disfigured and ugly, you know. Yeah. And the desert takes the weak. My desert. Um, and that goes into like the, the next one, the monster, right? The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the Phantom of the Opera, Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> Um, the Elephant Man is something that's maybe a little bit more recent. If only I could find her, so she could see me. Just lovely friends here now that perhaps she could love me as I am. I tried so hard to be good. But I found it interesting too in researching that you know the the monster, the word monster comes from um, the Latin word monstrum, which is um, omen. Typically, and in, in, unfortunately, in, in movies that deal with disability, it's usually a bad omen that's associated with this kind of uh, with this kind of character. And then we get. I into- will say, I'm, I'll also try to come up with a positive example. Harry Potter has like a facial scar. I don't know if I'd call it a deformity, but it's sort of a well, visible difference. No, definitely. I think the, the scar is a very important thing, and also the scar. On the, I'm glad you brought it up. You know, the Lion King scar has a scar, right? And he's the villain, and the scar typically in movies it's the left eye. The left eye in, in a lot of cultures um, is seen as the evil eye um, mm-hmm. and not the right eye. So it's, if you if you do see a scar, it's, it is typically on the left eye. And what I found, the book I'm, the book I've read, it's an old book called The Cinema of Isolation. It's by uh, Martin F. Nordham, and it was written in uh, 1994. So it's a bit of an older piece of literature, but I still find it uh, pretty relevant. He goes into great detail. We get into a little bit more nuance here, in my opinion, but there's still some, and they're, they're, like you said, there's going to be positives too, but it's the maladjusted. Um, and this is typical we see of like the bitter self-pity um, kind of character. It makes me think of Million Dollar Baby. Exactly. Like, the ending another. that was so impactful. And, you know, I think it was an award-winning film. It got yeah. a lot of recognition. But at the end, I would say that that was a maladjustment where someone who sustained a spinal cord injury couldn't live the same life she was living and chooses to end her life. That's, you know, that says a lot about how people that aren't disabled view the disabled. Um, right. Don't let me lie here till I can't hear those people chanting no more. Um, the next is the gifted, and and when I say gifted, I think I'd lean more towards uh, maybe the supernatural, the kind of the shaman character, and, or and like Rain Man. Exactly, or Rain Man. How did you know my phone number? How'd you know that? You said read the telephone book last night. Did you memorize the whole book? No. You start from the beginning. Yeah. How far did you get? G. And this is also seen as like, you know, Longmore says as a compensation for the loss, right? God's compensating you for, for losing. So we're going to make this person extraordinary. Rain Man, it's his, 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 you know, it comes from his autism, but it's just this brilliance he has, right? Um, that's mm-hmm. that shines. And there's just countless movies about blind people who have this kind of supernatural instinct about nature and the world around them or the bad Daredevil. guys. Daredevil is a perfect example, right? Daredevil is that guy. How did you just do that? I'm a really good lawyer. And I'm, I'm um, like, and there's what? that Asian Jedi in um, Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> exactly. And one that I remember as a kid thinking about, um, now you, you could argue whether this, this is a disability or not, but for me, it, it's it's still, he's still away from the quote unquote normal, which is like powder. He he was reintegrated into society. He, he was he went to mainstream school, was bullied, but he had like these these weird powers. He had these kind of this, this thing with electricity. He had this kind of sixth sense about things. And at the end of the movie, he gets struck by lightning and he just vanishes. Which makes him like kind of like otherworldly in a sense, mm-hmm. not humanized at all. 
right? Um, yeah, and he has alopecia too. I remember him yeah. being bald and like yeah, bald. bald and white. Yeah, exactly. His mother abandoned him or she died. I don't remember the specifics, but which I, is I think overlapping with that subhuman. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, and we'll find that a lot of these things kind of do overlap, right? And there is no like real chronological history of these things because we do we we still do see the monster sometimes. We still do see the criminal villain, right? I think I think as time goes on, I think we probably are starting to see more of the maladjusted. And what I'll get to is like the last uh, the last of his characters that, that, that I see in the book, but I have one that I kind of, um, I don't know if I've invented it, but, but it's something that I definitely want to see and what I, what I hope the future of cinema brings. But but the last one that, that Longmore talks about is the heroic character, which is the overcoming of the disability. And a lot of times it's not the physical disability. I think it's more of the emotional uh, ideas of disability. Th this character we're going to see a lot more of. It, this has become really kind of the mainstream and, and some of the movies that are referenced here, I think, are Oscar winners too. It's like The Theory of Everything in 2014 about uh, Stephen Hawking. We have Peanut Butter Falcon, The Sound of Metal, Stronger in 2017 with Jake Gyllenhaal. A lot of these are the people who have this disability happen to them and all of a sudden now have to learn how to deal with it. And to me, this is this is like an integration of maybe the social um, model and also the rights model of disability. And here's where I want your kind of opinion on this. I'm formulating these ideas. There's nothing that's written in stone here for me. This is a correlation I just found in doing the little bit of research that I've done. So like the rights model, in my opinion, right, is, is all about giving rights to the disabled people with disabilities, um, civil rights and their liberties. So I would argue that the gifted character as well as the um, heroic character tend to fall into kind of these rights categories because we have society is seeing them as they're able to overcome their disability and see it in a positive triumphant light and because maybe they're they're gifted in some special way that they are now seen as equal yeah That's and it just way. reeks of like ableism and valuing people based on their abilities <laughs> it's like yeah. oh they have to be extra special to like make up for whatever defect exactly. They have. exactly. Yeah. but after i kind of wrote all these notes i thought to myself what is the purpose of this conversation you and i are having right what do we want to see in the future and to me i kind of just made up the authentic character right mm -hmm. something that that we really start to see the nuance of and it's it's the lived understanding of disability i, I think in order to talk about that i have to talk about this other piece of literature i, I read which is that the cinema of isolation which really gets into um uh, what the author Norden describes as, uh, as the three kind of historical eras of filmmaking of, with people with disabilities in filmmaking. And the first is from the film origins from the early 1900s to the late 1930s. And typically what we're seeing here are, are those freak shows, the monsters, the pitiful characters, the, mm -hmm. the, the poverty characters. We're not really get to, getting to see them through their lens at all. It's, it's always through society or the government. And it's always kind of like looked at as, as negative. Yeah, and it's a show. It's like a on display, objectifying people. Exactly, exactly. The freak show, right? The circus. And it's so funny because um, there's a recent, I, I guess it's relatively recent, American Horror Story. You know that anthology mm. series had a whole season that was literally called Freak Show. Yeah. featured a lot of people with disabilities and a lot of actors portraying people with disabilities. But I think part of the horror of that season is that dehumanization. Yeah, and I think it does probably a good job, right, of, of, uh, like, of recreating the history of it and not really kind of, maybe not showcasing it, but maybe hopefully doing it in a more authentic, horrific way if the genre, if that's what the genre is, is leading it up to. And so the, the next era he describes is from World War II to the 1970s. And this he describes it as kind of the exploratory era of, of cinema. This is where we get into the kind of, I believe, the charity or the medical model of disability as a struggle to overcome, right? Mm -hmm. This thing has happened to me or I'm born with this thing and now I have to figure out a way how to deal with it. And that's that's pretty much all this narrative is, is going to be about. So typically that what, what happened with the maladjusted characters, that came after World War II because we saw a lot of uh, disabled mm -hmm. vets come home. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have movies like The Stratton Story starring James Stewart who was a baseball player who shot himself in the leg on a, on a hunting accident. And then he was reintegrated to baseball and he, you know, he hated his prosthetic. He, he was mad at the world, mad at his family. His family was the one that showed him love and support. His peers showed him love and support. 
um, but he was the one that was that was bitter and not okay. And to me, what this represents is almost the social model of disability, right? Where where society is saying it's okay, we're gonna we're gonna take down these barriers, we're gonna integrate you into society. But now it's up to the person with a disability mm-hmm. is where is where the um the victimhood lies, right? Is where is where the problem is. The third and, and the last era he he talks about is 1970s, and I'll say to the relative present, um, because I do think we're, we're moving into a new era. Yeah. In my opinion. But he describes this one as the incidental. It is primarily about social justice, um, sexuality, and the kind of day-to-day life. And, and in my opinion, I think we're getting more towards a more authentic version of disability and, and a, a couple of those movies that that come out of there that time frame coming home starring i believe jane fonda and john voight that movie's talked about a lot in this book and it's something that i recently saw that did kind of resonate with me that did feel more authentic that wasn't just about disability and it, and it was this kind of nuanced look at a character and it was it, it did deal with a vietnam vet where despite this person you know being a disabled vet he still is able to to find love and appreciate love she hurt when he hurt she changed when he changed she fell in love with him. Paul K. Longmore does, he does talk about suicidal as another kind of character, but but I, I in my opinion, I feel that the maladjusted, that, that comes in play with the maladjusted. Because yeah. that can be an unfortunate result of the maladjusted character is the suicide, the, the, the need to die. And yeah, and, and it's part of a chronic illness, right? People who are chronically depressed, isolated, you know, lack of support system, they can certainly fall victim to die by suicide, but that's not, like you're saying, a well-rounded depiction. And it shouldn't be the common association of what people are seeing um, mm-hmm. when it comes to these, any number of disabilities. Um, so. Yeah, and that movie came out in like 1978. So that's yeah. kind of still, it's funny that you're, you're citing these things because I feel like even though that was technically under the incidental period, I think it was part of that shift into the newer mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. era that we're in. I believe today, moving forward, what we need is is an internal era. To me, what that means is that these stories are actually coming from people with disabilities. To me, that means in front of and behind the camera so that we have people with disabilities in Hollywood, in independent film, as content makers, as social influencers that are actually creating, and we're, and we're seeing it more. We're seeing mm-hmm. it more now. And that's why I, I, you know, I'm, I'm framing it in this way that, that it's something that I'm seeing, that it's from coming from an internal place of people living these lives and creating their own content. And, I, and I'm hoping, I mean, I know we're dealing with the, with the strike right now. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic about everything. And AI is a whole nother, we, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. but, you know, I'm hoping that if this resolves nicely and, and, and amicably that, that we will start to see this internal kind of era in, in cinema that's going to ultimately lead to a more authentic character. You know, AJ, your producer on this podcast, where you're, um, he and I have also talked about the lack of nuance in some of these things. And sometimes, you know, you know, AJ and I deal with, with our limitations. You know, we, we deal with the, the emotional baggage that comes with having a disability. So we're not saying that movies should not show that but we're just saying that one it needs to be represented more authentically and that should not be what the entire story is about mm-hmm. right because it, it what that does is is when we have these and most of these movies that we're talking about the entire film the entire narrative is about the disability and and we say we said time and time again that you know disability isn't it isn't who we are it's a part of who we are it doesn't you know it doesn't define us but it is definitely a a big a big part of us and I think yeah. that when you don't show the other aspects of, of life, that what you're doing is you're just dehumanizing people with disabilities. And, mm-hmm. and I, like, like I said earlier, I don't, I don't believe that we're ever going to shift into a, a new era and fully embrace a new era until we start to see more people with disabilities in these roles of writers, directors, and actors, and editors, and, and, and everything in, in between, to be honest with you. Couldn't agree more. I mean, a lot of what you're saying has resonated with other conversations I've had with people. Um, There's a lot of talk of tokenization and one dimensional characters and sort of avoiding this trap that people fall in where the character's plot line is all about their disability. And yeah, it doesn't feel real. It's not as relatable. You know, it's harder for people to find something in that character that resonates with them. So it's not as memorable. Um, So it's bad storytelling, you know. (laughs) um, So I feel like I just, I agree 100%. Uh, Let's talk about the medical model and also kind of on the side, the charity model of disability. How would you describe those? Those two are probably uh, closely related in my opinion. Um, In the charity model, it's it's seen as that people with disabilities need to be cared for 
I think by this model, it also just means in, in institutions and facilities. In that model, there is a separation of people with disabilities from um, society. Your patients, doctor, haven't moved in decades. What I know is these people are alive inside. Well, how do you know that, doctor? I know it. You know, not to get too in depth with this, but a lot of those facilities and institutions did not work out well. <laughs> putting it lightly, sure, yeah, we can yeah, say that. Yeah, putting it lightly. Um, and, yeah, and I think that's why this model is harder for people to understand because it seems like a positive thing, right? We want to be helpful like who, to people who need it. But then because of that power dynamic of like, oh, you need help or like you can't live in society, you have to be sequestered. Yes. It's, you know, getting at that infantilization mm -hmm. and dehumanizing, taking people's agency away from them. Um, I feel like those themes are what make the charitable model problematic. Obviously, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be helpful to people with disabilities who need it, but it's it's important to do that in like a, a humanizing way. Yeah, yeah. There's there's a right way to do that. Right. right. There's there's a better way. You know, maybe not a right way, but definitely a better way <laughs> to to do that. And and there is people in asylums. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they were monsters. All monsters are human. And that you know that we get to like the the medical model of of people with disabilities need to be treated or cured. You know, they need to be rehabilitated in order for them to kind of be reintegrated in society. It's not until they are treated or cured that they can um, maybe be a part of, of society. And while there are some disabilities that can be treated and maybe even cured, to me, what that's also saying is that you're not worthy of being part of society until you have treated your disability. And, and unfortunately, there are some disabilities that are not ever going to be treatable or, or cured. was cured all right. If you want to hear more conversations like this, hit that like button and subscribe to this Ability Clinic for more accessible and entertaining education. Till next time, thank you for watching, listening, and learning.